My name is Aaron Burke. Uh, I'm a professor of Near Eastern Archaeology in the department, Near Eastern Languages and Cultures Department at UCLA, and a proud member of the Alan Levy Center for Jewish Studies. Uh, and I welcome you today to a talk to be hosted by myself um, and my colleague in Hebrew Bible and Northwest Semitics, Professor Bill Schneiderwin, also from the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. Today we're going to discuss uh, his recently published book, The Finger of the Scribe, and since we're in this context, I can pick it up and show it to you. Uh, we'll, our talk will consist of a short presentation by Professor Schneiderwind, and then a discussion uh, led by myself uh, with a variety of different questions and following on and sort of expanding on um, what he introduces to us today. So without further ado, I welcome uh, Professor Schneiderwind to uh, give us a short presentation, and then we'll uh, look at some of the specific issues he raises. Thank you for joining well, us, Bill. You know, thank you, um, Professor Burke. Uh, I'm honored to be doing this for the Alan D. Levy C Center for uh, Jewish Studies. Um, and uh, I'm just going to share my screen. I prepared a few slides um, that I think will help communicate what I'm trying to do in this book. Um, this book was just published this year. Uh, let's see now. Um, it's called The Finger of the Scribe. How, and the question is really in the subtitle, How Scribes Learn to Write the Bible. Um, and I'll start um, maybe with a reflection on the title itself. I mean, where does it come from? Actually, I was thinking about this um, passage in the book of Exodus. Exodus 31, one of my favorite images of scripture, um, of the Torah. Uh, when God finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the covenant, the tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Um, so, but I, here, of course, they were talking about uh, the two tablets uh, and, and uh, I was thinking, you know, I'm interested in the human aspects of the Torah and, and of the Bible. Um, and how did the scribes themselves learn to write? But also the question of um, how did that um, process of education shape the Bible itself? Can we see how their education and uh, what they had to learn, how they learned to write impacted and is reflected in the pages of the Bible, right? So um, what's the problem here now uh, that this book wants to address? The first problem that I want to address and that needs to be addressed is the fact that um, there's almost no evidence for a scribal curriculum or education in ancient Israel in the inscriptional record. There are a few examples of different things. So for example, this is uh, uh, from Tel Zayat, uh, an abcidiary, the ABCs. There's an abcidiary from a place called Izbet Sarta. Um, there's a, uh, 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 a list of hieratic numerals, you know, from Kadesh Barnea. And then there were their famous examples from a place called Kuntiladaj Rud uh, of inscriptions. But really, on the whole, there's not a heck of a lot of information. As a matter of fact, Carol Vandertorn recently wrote a book <clears throat> on scribal culture, and he argued that we have almost no knowledge of uh, scribal curriculum in ancient Israel. Um, and that was uh, true. So this book tried to solve that problem. Now, there are three things that helped me, I think, solve this riddle. And the first one, um, I go and I defer to my, my colleague, uh, Professor Burke. Um, Professor Burke is the, was the director 
of the Jaffa Cultural Heritage Project. We excavated um, the ancient site of Jaffa. Um, and he was kind enough to make me a, an associate director on the, the dig, publishing one of the inscriptions from the dig. Um, uh, going there uh, over the uh, summers over several years. And in the course of his excavations there, one of the, I, I think, really profound um, contributions that he made was uh, in the uh, analysis of the destruction of the site of Jaffa. Jaffa was an Egyptian fortress um, that was built in the New Kingdom period. And he collected a lot of, and you can see here the Egyptian fortress, the gate of the Egyptian fortress uh, from his excavations. He collected a lot of radi radiocarbon samples from the site of Jaffa. And uh, uh, what these radiocarbon uh, results showed was that the site was destroyed um, a lot later than people thought, that the Egyptian presence in um, Canaan extended all the way into the late uh, 12th century, probably. Um, now, why is this significant? Uh, it's significant because the beginning of alphabetic writing and Hebrew writing then overlapped with the, uh, the Egyptian presence uh, in, the, um, in Canaan, in the New Kingdom, and the end of the Late Bronze Age. Okay, so that was one thing that uh, was uh, important. The other was my, my observations at a play, about a place called Amarna, or Tel El Amarna in Egypt. And this is in the southern part of Egypt. Um, and this is an artist's reconstruction of the site. And at the site, they found 300 letters written from various Canaanite rulers, including five letters from the city of Jerusalem, the ruler of Jerusalem, um, to Pharaoh in Egypt. So that meant they were learning cuneiform and, um, and the Egyptians were also learning cuneiform and including uh, at the site of Amarna were not only the letters from the Canaanite rulers, but also 40 school exercises written in cuneiform. So it made me start thinking, well, maybe the, the early Hebrew writers knew something of cuneiform curriculum. And this would give me a model um, for early Hebrew uh, curriculum, that early Hebrew curriculum maybe wasn't uh, created from scratch, de novo, right? Um, it had antecedents in the New Kingdom period from cuneiform uh, examples. It would give me a vector of transmission um, and then a third uh, example, uh, 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 another example of this, uh, is, and I'll come back to this in a second, is a lexical list from, uh, that was found, actually found at the site in Israel of, um, of Ashkelon. And this is one of several school texts from the very end of, of the late Bronze Age, the 12th century around, um, with school curriculum. Uh, in cuneiform uh, that were found in Israel at the time that Hebrew writing is beginning. Um, okay. Now the final, um, and this gives me another vector of transmission, evidence of a vector of transmission. Now the final thing that I discovered that I think was really important um, is uh, the analysis of the site of Kuntila Dajru. Now, what is Kuntila Dajru? It was a, de a desert fortress. The fortress is up here on the top of this site on a trade route that went from Gaza in the north down to the south to a, what is today a, a lot. And in this desert fortress at Kuntila Dajru, they found a number of um, inscriptions that were finally published, only finally published in 2012 in this book by uh, Zev uh, Meshel. And um, we had known about these inscriptions for a while, but they, they weren't published. Um, and when I started looking at these inscriptions, I realized this is an entire corpus of different kinds 
of school exercises from early in early Hebrew uh, scribes. So let's like, take a look at this. This is a, an archaeological plan of the fortress. And here's the gate of the fortress, which is the most important part, because in, in the gate, they found a number of inscriptions. Uh, on the walls of the gate area, they found plaster wall inscriptions. Um, for example, this particular inscription I like a lot. It has the title uh, for the apprentices of the commander of the fortress. So it looks like they were writing some um, uh, school texts on the walls that were uh, to be read and taught um, to the uh, the soldiers that were working uh, at the fortress. They also found a number of uh, other inscriptions, including uh, inscriptions on two huge pithoi. These, these are pithoi, they're about like four feet high. And you can see um, they're written all around the whole pithoi, you know, the pithos, the storage jar. Um, and when we take a closer look at these um, uh, jars, we see that there are a variety of different kinds of um, scribal exercise. And in my book, I go through all the different uh, aspects of these uh, inscriptions. I'm just gonna give you sort of an hors d'oeuvre of a couple uh, different kinds of things. Let's take this, uh, in, this jar on the right and we'll do a projection drawing of the whole jar. So this is what the whole jar looks like if you roll out the, uh, the various inscriptions on them. And you can see different kinds of things going on. There are drawings of people, there are doodles. Um, <clears throat> on the very far right-hand side, there are what we call ABCDAs, Al Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, you know, the, uh, the Hebrew alphabet. And it's being written over and over again and actually you can actually see different handwritings in different ones. So the one on the top, for example, is not nearly as elegant as you see on some of the bottom ones. So you have um, different um, soldiers or students uh, and, and teacher probably also uh, writing here. Um, so you have multiple hands. They're using the, the pith also, the storage jar, as a kind of um, blackboard, if you will. Um, now, in the top left, very interesting, you can see that they're just, someone's just doodling and writing the letter Yod over and over and over and over again. There are at least, you know, 10 or so uh, examples of this. Um, and then on the right side and on the left side, uh, in between the third and the fourth abcidiary, on the right side, there's a list of uh, words written in alphabetical order. And then on the left side, there's another list. And lists, of course, were one of the most important genres of uh, scribal curriculum. You know, it's kind of like you go to school, you learn, you have vocabulary lists, right? Um, and vocabulary lists were very important in the ancient scribal curriculum. Okay, so you're beginning to see like some of the different kinds of uh, scribal exercises on this. And, um, I thought, well, do we have other examples of this? Can we, you know, put the pieces together, call out, tease out a little more uh, examples? And this brings us to one of the early inscriptions that are one of the more famous uh, inscriptions in Hebrew is something called the Gezer calendar, uh, which you have pictured here. And you have a nice little translation of it. Um, for years, People had argued over exactly what the Gezer calendar was. Um, it's called a calendar because, well, you know, maybe there are 12 months here. If you count the two months as, as the plural months as two, then and you add them up, it doesn't really work that well as a calendar. Um, so people were wondering, well, what exactly is this Gezer calendar? And we scholars have argued it over for, for years and years. Um, but one of the things I noticed when I was looking at this, and I, I thought, do we have analogies uh, to this? And sure enough, we do. In this cuneiform tablet that was excavated at Ashkelon, um, there is a 
lexical list. And in this lexical list, you have um, um, a, a very traditional vocabulary list uh, that juxtaposes reaping and harvest with um, uh, different kinds of words for time and expressions for time. This is very traditional. This is a very rigid uh, cuneiform list. You find these lists in Amar, in Babylon, in Nineveh, all over the Near East, and they're exactly the same everywhere. And they always juxtapose the uh, harvest with the month names. And what's even more important about this or interesting about this list is that the list actually also includes um, a column for West Semitic words. So it has a Sumerian word, an Akkadian word, and also a, a West Semitic or Proto-Hebrew word that's part of the list. Um, and this is found at Ashkelon from 1200 BC, just before, um, you know, you have the, uh, just about the time you're getting early uh, Hebrew uh, curriculum. And when we think of the Hebrew Bible and we look at different texts, we find all kinds of evidence. I could give lots and lo lots of evidence of lists and they're embedded in the Bible in a variety of different ways. I mean, here, for example, is just one example I I've written on recently uh, and in included in the book is um, an inventory list for Solomon's temple. Um, now, when we read this text, we don't think about it as list, but when you read about it, when you re read it and you and you realize this is a a a, a, a type of educational tool or, or practice exercise was making of lists, memorizing lists, then you, and you read Solomon's uh, uh, account of the temple, you realize these are being taken out of. Uh, and written on the basis of their uh, education uh, and the, uh, the ways they learned uh, to read and write. And I'll give you one more example of a list from Solomon um, that I always found really curious. And this is the passage in 1 Kings 5.13 um, when it's talking about Solomon's wisdom. And it says, Solomon would speak of the trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows in the wall and he would speak of animals, the birds, the, uh, you know, the reptiles and the fish. And I, and I thought, you think, well, okay, that sounds interesting. Why, you know, how does that illustrate uh, Solomon's wisdom? And then um, one learns when one studies cuneiform curriculum that in, voc in cuneiform vocabulary lists began always with uh, lists concerning wood products and then the second um, list that you that you learned as a student were lists about animals and so the two categories here of that are mentioned uh, about Solomon's learning are actually the two categories of Meso Mesopotamian Korea uh, cuneiform uh, list or vocabulary list uh, learning in the same order um, from the beginning to the next one, as you find in Mesopotamian lists. And I think that this is an allusion to um, the way Solomon was educated, but it's also a reflection of the fact that uh, there's a um, connection between the way Solomon learned and the way uh, um, uh, Mesopotamian cuneiform uh, traditional learning was done. Okay. Um, let's go back to this drawing and I'll give you just one last example and then uh, we'll have a little discussion. Um, in addition to the, uh, the lists and the ABCDAs and the other kind of doodling on this, on the top you have the, uh, the template for a practice letter and also next to the uh, line the vertical line to the left side of this is also another practice letter. And letters were one of the most important kinds of things you needed to learn how to do as a scribe in ancient Israel or in the Near East, you know, you have to learn, dear John, you know, the forms of letters, right? Um, and let's take a look at this more, uh, this uh, 
part of uh, the second letter here a little more specifically. Um, and I'll just read it for you. Uh, the, my translation is the speech of Am Amar, ya, uh, uh, Amar Yao. Speak to my Lord, are you well? May he bless you by, and then you have uh, the divine name of Taman and his Asherah. May he keep you, may he be with you. And this is the first half of the letter. So this is the form of a letter that's repeated over and over again. Um, you find them in all letters you have. But then the rest of the letter, I mean, we know this is the whole thing. We don't have the rest of the letter because we don't know what the content would be because, well, content of letters are always changed. The forms, though, are always the same. The other thing that's very interesting about this practice letter is they're playing um, in a very typical way, scribal exercise way on Hebrew roots. So the word uh, speech, uh, Omer, is from Israel, and then the person's name is, I think, not a real name. It's a, it's a practice name, Amar Yao, uh, Yao. You know, the Lord, you know, uh, speaks or uh, the speaker of the Lord, um, and then the imperative, speak and more, right? Speak to the, uh, my Lord. Uh, so you have this nice uh, practice that's being done here. And when you start thinking about it, like where, how does this practice of uh, learning to write letters uh, influence the Hebrew Bible? Well, it in influences in lots of different ways. So first of all, in the Torah and in biblical narratives more generally, um, they use speech and messenger uh, forms uh, that are bound up in learning to write letters as a way of framing biblical narratives. So biblical narratives um, uh, use the form of letters and speech um, back and forth um, as a way of uh, telling narratives. And then there are mundane parts of biblical uh, Hebrew style. For example, the use of uh, lemor, say, saying, you know, um, Moshe El, you know, and Moses said to so and so, Le Mor, saying, which really means quote. Um, but this is a feature of the uh, messenger and letter uh, writing. And then in letters, the body of a letter is always intro introduced by the expression Veta, which means, uh, or translated, and now. Uh, the expression occurs over three times, 300 times in the Hebrew Bible. And one wonders, well, why is it so frequently? Well, because when you learn to write letters, that's a that's a, the marker of a new paragraph. That's the transitional marker from the beginning of the letter to the body of the letter. And then in the Hebrew Bible, they also use it as a, tri uh, a transitional marker uh, uh, that is reflected in their, edu uh, uh, adopted from their education. And finally, most famously, um, divine speech itself um, comes from uh, uh, messenger formulas. And let me just give you some examples of this in the Hebrew Bible. Um, I'll give you three quick examples. Second Kings 10, you know, verses 1 and 2. Jehu wrote letters and sent them to Samaria, um, to the rulers of Jezreel, to the elders and to the guardians, which read, Lemor, saying, and now, veta, your master's sons are with you. So this is borrowed. These are conventions borrowed straight from learning to write uh, letters, as, and it's even alluding this to this in this text itself. Or you know, in uh, in the Torah, in uh, uh, Genesis thirty-two, we have the story of Jacob sending uh, messengers to his brother Esau and instructing them, Komar, thus you shall say. You know, to my Lord uh, uh, Asa, thus says your servant Jacob. So you get these kind of forms of uh, from so and so to so and so. Um, uh, and then you have messengers writing back saying, Le more, you know. Uh, and so you get this back and forth uh, uh, of messengers that are essentially using a letter style. Uh, we think, we tend to think of it as oral literature. But actually, they learn the forms uh, when they're learning to write letters. 
and um, and then letters are of course an oral performance, um, but they're rooted in the scribal practice of learning to write letters. And then just one last example, and we'll end with this um, as one of the examples of of prophetic speech. Of course, divine speech is 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 the quintessential example of borrowing um, letter writing as a form. Um, uh, you get it here in Jeremiah 29. Um, Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, um, um, because you sent letters in your own name to all the people, uh, to Zephaniah, son of Messiah, the priest, and to the rest of the priests, saying, the Lord appointed you um, priest instead of Jehoiada, the priest to exercise authority, and so on and so forth. Um, so you get a, a embedded in the prophetic um, uh, message, of course, um, a reference to letters, uh, which is nice, um, but the very uh, form that we see so frequently in the Hebrew Bible, thus says the Lord, right, kol mar adonai, um, is itself a borrowing of the form of, uh, of letter writing. Okay, and so that's a a quick synopsis of my uh, of my book, and I hope we can have some uh, uh, discussion of it. And I will... Well, Bill, thank you so much. It's um, always a tall order to try to summarize several years of research and what amount to multiple articles that come together to build a big thesis like this in a matter of 30 minutes. Um, so thanks for trying to do that and certainly highlighting um, some central parts of it. Um, you know, I really enjoyed uh, having an office next to you over the years. You know, we've worked together. I've been at UCLA more than 15 years now. I miss having the office next to you and this conditions with COVID. But as part of that, we often had conversations about this. And I got to see firsthand the way that you were working with Kuntila Dajrud. And we had a wonderful time bouncing some ideas back and forth. And I was wondering if you could refresh my memory and certainly the audience's memory. What what for you was the kind of aha moment with how you approach the Kuntilator Rude material? Because traditionally this has been discussed in the context of religion, religion, religion. This must be a cultic site. We've got these individuals that you showed on the ceramics there walking along together, um, hands up raised, and of course on the inscriptions, as you pointed out, um, these references to Yahweh and his Asherah, which before these inscriptions and the uh, tomb inscriptions um, at Kerbet el Kom, this was a sort of enigmatic expression we hadn't heard of before. So with their publication in 2012, as you began to sift through it, what, what for you was this aha moment? Well, I mean, that, that's a great question. Um, and the thing is, we've known about these inscriptions for a long time, right? Um, I think the first inscriptions were published in the 70s. Um, so Kuntila Ajud was ex excavated in the 70s. Um, and, and we, and, but it was never published together, right? We right. only got the sensational publication. So, you know, this one piece of, um, may you be blessed by, uh, uh, Yahweh and his Asherah, uh, but we never saw the context. And when I started reading the volume was, and when it was published in 2012, even in that volume, they published every single inscription on the jar separately, as if it was unrelated to everything else on the jar. Um, but when I looked at the jar and I saw, well, here you've got a letter or a blessing formula. And here you've got abecidiaries and lists and you know very, very typical scribal exercises. And oh, over here you've got more, you know, scribal exercises and doodle, scribal doodles. And I thought you need to look at this thing holistically as a whole jar and everything that's going on. And it's just started dawning on me that all these things are practice. And once you uh, begin to understand that everything is scribal practice, um, then the interpretation begins to take a, a turn. And um, 
even things that were fragmentary. So I didn't give you both of the the letters. One of the the other letter on that jar is fragmentary. Um, but when you understand that it's a school exercise, when you have, in other words, when you have context, um, then it's easy to reconstruct something. But if you have no context, right, it's hard to understand it. So, um, so yeah. So it, it, I, I would say that it's looking at things in, a, in their larger context, both the context of the jar, the context of the fortress, the context of the larger, you know. Um, uh, uh, view of, of, of things. So, I mean, and that was the sort of aha moment uh, for Kuntila Dajrud. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting too, because as you were, you were answering that, I was thinking, gosh, since the 1970s, when this was found, we've had a lot of inscriptional material come out. I mean, you've written extensively on the Tel Dan inscription, an Aramaic that was recovered in the late 1990s. Uh, well, mid to late 1990s from Tel Dan in northern Israel. Um, we've had the Zayat abecedary, the, for those uh, laypersons who don't know what an abecedary is, this alphabetic inscription found in a fairly common, you know, environment. In fact, it was on the back of a stone that was in the foundations of a building, so not exactly uh, being profiled. Um, it does strike one, and it's kind of fascinating that this site is so far away from the very sort of place that everyone centers the discussion of scribalism, namely Jerusalem. Um, and it also sort of evokes to my mind when I was revisiting this today before the talk that, you know, isn't it curious that the preservation of scribalism is best on the margins in the places like the Dead Sea Scrolls squirreled away in caves in this desert away from Jerusalem, um, even um, the Ter Tel Der Allah inscription in Aramaic, you know, uh, not in a place that you would consider all that central. And here you are along this roadside fortress, which I guess brings me to this question or uh, that it'd be interesting to get your sense of. Um, you, you develop in the book very nicely its connection to military affairs. Can you say a little bit about why we should find such a scribal investment in a fortress, which I think you and I would agree probably never held more than 20 people <laughs> at any given moment. And then of course, uh, passers-by. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think it has its roots in, also in the late bronze new kingdom period. Um, the, you know, the main use of writing was administrative and administrative for the New Kingdom period meant the colonial presence of the Egyptians in Canaan. There's a very famous text in uh, in Egypt called Papyrus Anastasi, or uh, better known as the Craft of the Scribe, and basically it's about how to be a military scribe working in Canaan. Uh, most of the the people who were Egyptians or Canaanites working for the Egyptians probably were learning uh, to read and write in cuneiform because that was the lingua franca of the entire world at the time. And most of their work had to do with diplomatic slash military slash economic um, things. So they were, they, were, they were military slash administrative uh, kind of scribes, but a military was, or military actions were an important part of what you had to know and do as a scribe and I think so the early um, writing and, and, and even as we go through the writing in the mil military became one of the most important aspects. I mean one of the most famous and one of my favorite inscriptions from ancient Israel is called um, is from uh, Lachish, Lachish number three. It's known as the, um, the letter of the literate soldier um, and in this letter uh, a senior officer had written to a junior officer, apparently accusing him of not being able to read and write and asking him to go get a, himself a scribe. And he writes back, he says, no, I am I can read and write. I'm cut to the heart at your ac accusation that I'm illiterate, right? Um, and the, of course, the amazing thing is that a junior officer in the army 
you know, is cut to the heart at the, at the insinuation that they were in, illiterate. But I think more importantly, it illustrates the importance of the military, writing in the military um, that goes back to the very origins of uh, uh, ancient Israel. And even if you think about the cor other corpus, uh, major corpus of ancient Israelite inscriptions, and that would be um, the Arad letters, right? At, at Arad, at the fortress Arad, there's a hundred um, ostraca, which are most, most their lists and letters, and uh, they deal with the administration of a, a small military fortress. You know, sometimes it's sending supplies, sometimes sending soldiers, just some, sometimes just lists of different things. Um, but write, reading and writing was very important in, in administration and, mili and slash military bureaucracy uh, in antiquity. Yeah, um, and you know, related to that, the thing that comes out of these inscriptions for Kuntil Rajrud is the, the, the question of Israel, Judah, Israelite, Judean presence at the fortress. Can you comment on a little bit more about that with respect to these inscriptions at Kuntilat Azrud and Azrud and, and what you think is going on there? Why do we see Israelite, what would you call them, uh, indexes within the, the writing? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the curious things about Kuntilat Azrud, uh, that it is not a Judean fortress, but a Sumerian Israeli fortress. Um, and some of the indexes, well, in the letters, uh, in the blessings, one of the formula that you find is Yahweh of Samaria. And also in the in the letter that I, uh, I um, that I read with with you all, uh, the name uh, of the person was Amar Yao, mm -hmm. instead of Amar Yahu. Right. Amar Yahu would be a typical Judean Jerusalemite spelling of a personal name. And Amar Yao is an Israeli and Sumerian spelling of a personal name that you find, for example, in the Sumeria Ostraca. Um, so that's it. And also in the in the material culture at the site, it's Israeli and Northern mostly. Um, the site was probably part of trade routes. And if you think about different periods of, of, is, uh, of um, Israeli and Sumerian hegemony. These, this site probably arose in the ninth century as a major site. Um, that would be like equivalent to arising in the time of Omri, um, Ahab, and who had connections with Phoenicia. And of course, what is it doing? It's taking trade from the Mediterranean to a lot. Um, and we actually know stories about um, uh, th this kind of trade uh, with the Phoenicians. And Israel was much more involved in that than Judah was. So this probably is uh, a time period in which um, the Northern Kingdom of Israel had ascendancy over and control over Judah. And this was a, a lucrative trade route, right? The Red Sea to the Mediterranean. Um, and they were probably hooking up with the uh, Phoenicians um, to exploit uh, this. And they built a, a, a fortress there that flourished at the end of the ninth century, the beginning of the eighth century, a time when Israel was uh, much more powerful than Judah. Right. Yeah, I was, I was wondering how we were interpreting that because there's certainly that sort of broader historical context. I've also wondered if you couldn't see joint operations, excuse me, joint operations as part of the um, combined effort there at the fortress that if, if there wasn't in, perhaps in the eighth century, just before the destruction of Samaria, uh, a phase of sort of um, allied efforts between Judah and Israel, as we hear about in occasional episodes of uh, joint sort of trade endeavors elsewhere in the Bible. But um, I don't know, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, it's, it is interesting. I didn't talk about it in the in the talk, but if you think about that route that goes from Elat to Gaza, and I highlighted Kintilat Ajrud, but another 50 kilometers away is Kadesh Barnea. Mm -hmm. And Kadesh Barnea is a Judean fortress 
that existed from the 10th century to the 7th century. There are school texts in, you know, uh, in Judean Hebrew at Kadesh Barnea. And Kadesh Barnea and Kuntila Dajrud probably existed at the same time. And they were, you know, a couple days ride, a donkey uh, rides uh, away from each other, right? You know, watering holes along this route. So it's easy to see that there could have been some sort of cop cooperation uh, at different times. Um, the Ju uh, Judah uh, had more control of this route, probably in the 10th century, maybe, I don't know, certainly in the, in the 7th century, they had a uh, look, after the destruction of Samaria. But Judah, of course, always had a vested interest in this trade route as well, just like Phoenicia did, just like Egypt did, just like the Edomites did, you know, different players. And of course, you have the ebb and flow of these partnerships. Um, and unfortunately, when we get the inscriptions, what we see is a snapshot in time of one moment um, of a, probably of Israeli uh, um, ascendancy, but there might have been other times when it was much more cooperative and maybe Judah took a, 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 a larger role, but we just don't have enough evidence to talk um, about those different, the, the different ebbs and flows of the history of um, Kuntila Dajrud. I do think though, I, I would emphasize that Kuntila Dajrud was a site that was used throughout the Iron II period. Um, some scholars think it's a one period site that it only exists for like one generation, but I think there's good evidence as I've written about that it was uh, occupied for a much longer time. And it makes sense because there aren't a lot of great places um, to, to, to water your donkeys on that trade route. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, it might've been well-developed and flourishing in certain periods and kind of had its low points in other periods, but I think it was always a stopping point along um, that route from Gaza to uh, a lot. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't, just by way of closing, um, this is not your first book on the question of scribalism as you've been developing this thesis. Um, this one certainly is, to, to my mind, um, really reaches a crescendo because of this data from Kuntila Dajrud and your sort of layering of these studies that build up. And as you know, in, in the kinds of studies that we engage in, they certainly layer together to ultimately build the data set. Where are you going from here? What's the next project you're working on and how does it build out from Finger of the Scribe? Yeah, you're right. I mean, I you're thinking of course of my earlier book, How the Bible Became a Book, which first tried to give, I would say a slightly more popular uh, discussion of the social context for the Bible and, and the writing of the Bible. Um, uh, the finger of the scribe is more focused on how scribes learn to write their education. Um, but one of the things I thought of when I was working on this was, you know, our models for education. And um, we tend to think of schools, um, but uh, education, as I realized, and as scholar, other scholars have realized this too, was much more of an apprenticeship model. It wasn't like school houses and, you know, independent, uh, independent scribes, but rather, you know, you like a craftsman, um, a metal worker. Um, actually, this is nicely developed by one of your uh, recent uh, PhD students, uh, Nadia Ben Marzouk about metal crafts uh, workers, um, but which has helped me think about this. So now I'm uh, working on a book that deals with um, scribal communities and the history of scribal communities and the development of different scribal communities in ancient Israel and how communities of learning or apprenticeship systems influence the uh, formation of the Bible and the different kinds of literature that we have in the Bible. And I think we can identify different kinds of communities. There were soldier scribes, mm -hmm. there were temple scribes, there were the Amha arts or the people of the land who had scribes and scribal communities that were associated with them. Um, 
there are bureaucrats in the in the palace as well. I mean, so there are a variety of different communities of scribes, um, and they're related to this way we learn and create um, bonds and form bonds in in learning and education. Um, actually, talking about it with my students today, I said, you know, in some ways we're kind of like an apprenticeship system, mm -hmm. right? We learn together and and we form bonds that, you know, transcend um, uh, uh, this, especially in, in a, like a graduate program, as opposed to, let's say, you know, in high school, when you're sitting in a classroom of 40 people or whatever, um, you might develop friends in high school, but you're not really learning necessarily together. But if, every, but if you're learning in a one room schoolhouse in an apprenticeship system, you create bonds and relationships and you learn things together and those things shape the way um, you write and think uh, for you know the, the rest of your life. And so that's what I'm gonna uh, be working on in this, this new book. Well, we will be very excited to see it. I will be delighted to do this again to discuss that book in due course. Um, just want to close by thanking everyone for joining us and uh, hope that everyone's well. And uh, again, um, would like to thank the uh, Alan D. Levy Center for hosting this and giving us the opportunity to um, profile your book, The Finger of the Scribe. Thanks again, Bill. Thank you.